Hi, everyone. Tonight, we're going to do something a little, you know, most of my videos are about financial independence. Uh, what many of you may not know is I was the first African American to serve as a physicist in the Air Force. And with the current world situation, I feel compelled to share that story. So tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about that story. And then next week, I'm going to introduce to you the mentoring program that I use with minorities in STEM. This program really applies to anyone who feels like a fish out of water, who feels like they're trying to succeed in an unfamiliar culture where no one really seems to want you to succeed. OK, see, a lot of us who don't have that struggle, we would say, well, why don't you just find another job? But when the whole industry immediately judges you by your gender, your color, your accent, your orientation, anything that makes you stand out from the industry norm, then you need to know how to succeed when they say you can't. So for those of you who are just joining us, my name is JJ Conway. And like I said in the intro, I was the first African-American to serve as a physicist in the Air Force. I know some of you in my group, you've been, some of you are new and added in the last couple of weeks, but I know most of you, we've been building wealth together for a couple of years now. And you probably surprised to hear that I was a physicist for 23 years in the Air Force because you know me as a business and personal finance expert. And so before I get into the content today about how I was told I couldn't do physics because I was black and how I did it anyway, uh, I just want to highlight what happened that caused an Air Force physicist to go into full time financial planning. The first time I got out of debt was because I did the dumb college student thing and accepted every card they gave me. I was in it for the free t-shirts, y'all. <laughs> oh my goodness. All they had to do was dangle a little bit of swag in front of me. And I was like, sign me up for this card or that card. I didn't realize those low interest rates were introductory and they'd pack a wallop once I graduated and got a job. Oh boy, did they ever. I had so much debt that when I went to set up my first little apartment and I went to Kmart and I filled the cart with the pots and the towels and all the little things I was going to need as a newly minted lieutenant in the Air Force. Oh, I got to the checkout and I did what everybody else was doing. I applied for the Kmart credit card, right? Only unlike everybody else who was getting accepted on the spot, I was told mine would take about an hour to get approved and I could hang out for a little bit and then go check with customer service. And I wasn't worried. I mean, come on. I was always pretty frugal. I always paid my bills and I always had a little something left over. Only they didn't approve me. And I sat there embarrassed trying not to cry with a cart full of housewares in my Air Force uniform, being told my credit wasn't good enough for a $1,000 worth of Kmart credit card. Mm. And they mailed me a copy of my credit report. And I couldn't have told you where all those charges come from. I mean, I was a college kid. I, I didn't really understand credit. I thought as long as you paid the bills, you were okay, right? <laughs> nope. Nope, 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 nope. And so the late Larry Burkett helped me get out of debt. Hey, that rhymes. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, I would distract my own self. I couldn't even afford the $8 for his cassette tape course, but he sent it to me. Anyway, as long as I promised to help someone with his materials once I got out of debt. I got out of debt using his materials in 1998, and I've been helping people win with money ever since. Unfortunately, I didn't think business debt was the same as personal debt. And my ex and I fell into this trap of taking a series of 125% loans on our someone, some real estate guru that came to our town and had a meeting said that if you, if you would do this with all your properties, no one would ever sue you because you owed more on the property. You were sue proof and we did it. 
we weren't supposed to sign it. We weren't supposed to spend any of that money. That was our agreement, right? So it's actually sat there. It actually touched. But this and that happened. And I went away for a six month military trip, trying to make some extra money to make. And I came home to find my house sold, my stuff thrown out, divorce papers. And when the dust settled, I was a $145,000 of debt. I had to hustle hard and I applied the same financial principles to my business as I did to, oh, I'm sorry, if I had, if I had applied the same financial principles to my business that I did to my life, yes, he would have still run up six figures of debt in my name, but it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been 845,000. Talk about a stupid tax, right? I did have to learn how to hustle in a hurry. Hustles in addition to my day job and picking. That's where you find stuff cheap at one consignment shop and you go sell it somewhere else, right? Or you find it at a, gar a yard sale or, or a bin or anything like that and you, you go resell it, right? So that, <laughs> well, that's why my second career is all about wealth building. But my first love has always been science. I just knew I was going to be an astronaut one day, y'all. And I haven't crossed it off my list yet because you never know, right? You never know. The thing is, it's really hard to go after a dream when you has been programmed and has programmed you that it's impossible. If you today have a dream, how many of you have a dream and people tell you, you crazy, who you think you are? Get off your high horse. Hmm. I want to encourage you to pursue that dream. I'll lay out for you today some of my challenges, and then I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of how I succeed. This is great content with, for everyone, but my intention with this talk is to either find themselves in a white dominated career field or people who have a dream, but your support system, it feels like they're not supporting you. They just want to tear you down, right? About today and next week, it's going to be great also for those of you who work with young people who will find themselves in that situation, okay? So the title of my talk today, uh, it was Blacks Can't Do Physics. And then I realized I don't like that negativity. So physics, but we put the T in apostrophe. It comes, it comes from back when I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy, trying to decide what degree to pursue. Okay. Now I had straight A's in math. I had all these straight A's. I, 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 I was good at those subjects, but I was so I just thought chemistry and math were just the most boringest things. Like, ah, uh, I could do it, but it wasn't exciting. It wasn't cool like physics where you got to it and design rocket ships, you know? So I go talk to each of the advisors and the chem advisors like, we best student. If you want to come in, I'll, I'll, I'll be your advisor. But you know, if you really like physics, you should go talk to them. And uh, so I go and talk to the physics uh, advisor and I couldn't believe my ears, y'all. I ears. I even like I, I've told this story since 2007. Right. And it still gets me chalked up that somebody would say this to a young person. The guy says, you can't, you can't declare physics. And I'm like, what do you mean? I can't de declare physics. And he's like, blacks can't do physics. Oh, it my mind up for me that day. I declared physics. All right. Not only did I declare physics, but you're going to hear in a second, some pretty good things. <laughs> now, though a handful of my physics instructors did support me, um, I found myself pretty much rejected by a lot of my peers and most invited to the study groups. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to pause just for a second because most people who've heard this talk, I, I, I try not to punctuate it with what I'm about to say because I'm usually, and 
in this case, I don't know who I'm talking to, right? You're, it's all whoever watches this on the internet. And I just realized that my stuff is pink. I totally did not mean to make my stuff pink. That was for a whole different class, but it's pink today, y'all. Pink, pink for physics. <laughs> you know what we're gonna do? <laughs> we're gonna change that midstream. <laughs> here, let's go with let's go with something else here. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm distracted by um, but the, but normally I I <laughs> normally I do this with a particular audience. And with that particular audience, I really don't have to qualify what I say. But I'm going to do it today because I don't know who I'm talking to today. Not every problem that a person of color has is due to race. Okay. And, um, you know, sometimes we think it's race, but sometimes, especially for physicists, okay, uh, physicists tend to be loud mouth and opinionated. I don't know about loud mouth. I think that's just the, the rare physicist like me that's very uh, outgoing at times. But but we know we're right and we don't have any problem telling you we're right because we know we're right. And of course, if we're right, you should want us to tell you we're right because then we can help you be right. And we really don't understand until we've had some experience working with people. We really don't understand why you don't want us to tell you that we're right and you're wrong. In fact, I've been leading people for over 20 years. I how to do leadership, right? Like I do leadership training, you know, but I, and I still don't understand why I've just accepted you're wrong. You want me to ask you questions and show you and make you think like it was your idea. But when I'm with somebody else who's like me and we can just let our hair down, I love it because, oh girl, you're wrong for that. This, 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 and this, and this. And they'll bring their analysis and they'll bring their analysis. And it, and, 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 and neither one of us is offended because if, if you know some, know it so I can be better because I want to be right. Cause that's what I do. <laughs> um, if you have that attitude, or let's call it a gift. Let's say you have the gift of being very analytical and often right, if not always right. Okay, like like my husband is just about always right. Uh, I'd say 99.9% .9 of live in the 0.1% when he's not. Uh -huh. um, no, seriously, he's awesome. Uh, but but if you if you are in a situation where you work around people who do not think the way you think, I want to caution you not to automatically assume that everything is based on race. It could be that it could be that you're always right and people are tired of being wrong. It could be that you're like me, a little weird, a little quirky, I think eccentric. I think the more wealthy you get, the more people call you eccentric instead of weird, right? Like so so we don't we don't want to blame everything on race. Okay. Cause it's not always about race, but, but, I, but I, I can't not say that race isn't an issue when the instructor tells me you can't declare this as your major because blacks can't do physics. I mean, I can't, I can't excuse that away. And anybody who knows me personally, you know, that I every benefit of the doubt. Okay. And so I declared physics and um, even though, you know, like I was saying, a few of my my instructors did support me. I, I really did find myself rejected by most of my peers and, and educators. And, and I wasn't invited to the study groups, you know, and, and I would schedule time with my instructors to get extra help because some things I just didn't quite understand, you know, and I would come out more confused than when I went in. I finally found out why this was at the Air Force Academy when I went in for extra instruction one day. And this one instructor looked around. He made sure nobody else was in the physics department. And he leaned over to me and he said, look, my job is to get rid of you. And if you'll stop coming into my office for extra instruction, I will stop feeding you the wrong answers. That day I realized I was on my own. And if I want to make this, I am going to have to make it happen. Now, there's one thing about me that you are going to learn if you don't know it already. Okay. I'm going to make it happen. If I see something that I want, I'm going to go after it. And the only reason I won't make it happen is if I decide that the effort or the alignment of it is not aligned with me or the effort that I'm willing to give or the sacrifice that I'm willing to make. But, but you're not going to tell me no. I am going to find a way. I don't care how hard I have to work.
There's a great saying that I like, and I wish I could remember who came up with it, but it says, don't wait to be offered a seat at the table. Bring your own seat or build your own table. I did graduate uh, as president of the Physics and Astronomy Club. And I was high enough in my class that I earned a coveted full ride scholarship to engineering. And despite what that initial advisor went on to do physics in the air, three years, achieving the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I had many, 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 many amazing adventures. I had, I really do believe I had the coolest jobs in the Air Force. I had meetings at the White House. I was in charge of a plot. Super cool toys for our most elite military team. At some point in my career, I was either the Air Force vote or I was the chair of some of our nation technical. I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend that some of those things weren't just fell into my lap. You know, one of the it was really my boss's job, but he interest and really didn't want to take your uniform off, put on a suit and go to this meeting for me. And all of a sudden I become the Air Force vote. <laughs> My name is still on 15 years later, right? So it worked out for me, right? Um, unfortunately, the perceived, uh, this is so difficult for me to say, because I don't want to feed into stereotypes, but there is a perceived unintelligence of people of color that persists in the Air Force today. You know, there were times where I had my hand out and people walked by and just handed me the trash. Or when I showed up to the meeting and asked where I should sit, they told me where to drive the slides. Because not realizing that the same Conway on my name tag is the same Conway of the new chair of their committee. There have been times where I had to argue with people that I am indeed the chair of your, your new chair of the committee. My name is on my uniform. <laughs> There's no other Conway in the room. Okay. And so, um, you know, I think it took me 19 years, 19 years before I could actually sit down at the head of the table and everybody roll up their sleeves and we just get started with the technical and the science and doing the briefings. That's how long it took for us to be able, for me to have to stop proving that I even deserve to be in the room. Okay. So whether it is generational, racial, uh, gender, any of these biases, you know, generational bias is becoming a big thing now, whether people think you're too old and too, too old to contribute, or they think you're too young to know anything, right? You know, at some point, at some point, your dream is going to lead you into an obstacle that you had no part in creating. You're doing everything that you know how to do. Still, the doors are closing in. And it's not. I, I'm going to I'm going to agree with you on this. Okay? Sometimes, if, especially for the physicists in, 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 in the audience today, sometimes we do it to ourselves because we annoy everybody. And we, right. But but, you know, but but some. And sometimes it's not fair. You're doing everything you can do. The doors are still closing in your face. The opportunities. Other people who are less qualified and less effective at winning, the, the less effective at getting, winning the contracts. They're the ones getting the promotions. And you might be feeling not fair. And you know what? I agree. It's not fair. And you're not responsible. You're not responsible for that. But you are responsible to it. You are responsible to your. You are responsible to your life. And too many of us have allowed life, circumstances, and well-meaning but dream-killing people to back us and keep us playing small to win playing small man i wish i had a banner for that i should say that again you are never going to win 
playing small. So guess what I'm going to do today? I'm going to tell you how to win the game. Now, <laughs> and the time that I need to dig into every aspect of this, into every detail. We've got tonight where I'm going to share with you some things. And then we've got next week where we're actually going to dig into purpose, vision, goals. And we're also going to dig into excellence a little bit more. Okay. Uh, and today I'm going to lay some groundwork. Uh, but if, but, but I promise you, if you want to dig more deeply into these concepts, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that at the end of next week. If you want to know right now, you can PM me or make a comment, me, and I will be sure to reach out with you reach out to you with ways that you can start winning and turn your life around, literally turn your professional life around overnight with these concepts. All right. So what we're going to do for the rest of tonight is I'm going to share with you some reasons why someone who has so many struggles and obstacles to overcome should still consider a career in STEM in the first place, right? Then we're going to look at the major challenges that I faced and other technically minded people of color continue to face to this day. And then we're going to wrap up with an overview of the win the game steps that I'll go into details about more next week. Okay. So now if you or someone, you know, is interested in getting, please go to buildingwealthtogether.com and register for the so I, this is, this, I, this is a talk I've been paid 500 to $2,000, depending on the group, uh, whether they're a nonprofit or not to give this talk. Okay. But you're actually getting it for free tonight as part of my commitment for speaking at the global speaker summit last weekend. All right. So this is a special deal I'm doing for them and you get the benefit. Whoop, whoop. All right. First of all, why should you even care about a career in STEM? Why should you care? If nobody wants you to win, why should you even bother, right? The first thing is money, really good money. Even if you're not super technical, there's still a lot of great money to be made in the technical realm. In fact, when I was the chief of protocol for Air Force Global Strike Command, I was surprised that one of my favorite other chief of protocols at a different, uh, different base, she left that job to be one of our national labs, making 250 to 300,000 a year and, and social events and parties and, and tours of the lab and things like that for your senior leaders, your congressmen and all those kinds of people. I mean, talk about, right? But there are a lot of really, so, so what I want to highlight with that of really super cool job STEM. Because most of us today, mo especially especially uh, for my ladies, I want to talk to you know most of us today. If if you have an engineering or scientific mindset, you kind of a little bit different from everybody else. You really identified what I was talking earlier about annoying everybody else because you're always right. <laughs> you were like, oh yeah, that's me. Okay, um, but for for my young ladies today, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult because even though we're an increasingly very tolerant about 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 men who are uh, more feminine or women who are more talking, all right? I think in today's world, it's actually more acceptable for a woman to say, I identify as a man than it is for a woman to say, you know what? I think in a masculine way. But however we think the Lord made us the way we are, with the talents and the abilities and the ways that we are crafted to do whatever it is that we have been called. And so I learned very early about myself that there was something weird about me because all the other girls wanted to play Barbie dolls and they wanted to pretend they were getting married to Ken. And all I wanted to do was build stuff for the dolls or design dresses for the dolls. I didn't really care about playing with the dolls. I wanted to do all the exterior stuff. I wanted to build the car, build the couch, build and so um, I began to realize that at a very early age. And I really wish <laughs> in our in our ever so tolerant society, I wish we would become truly tolerant that, hey, you know what? It's OK to be a woman who thinks that way, because you know what? It is OK to be a woman who thinks that way. OK. And so that's why, you know, like I'm, I'm not. Yeah, of course, there's always the standard techie. Oh, you can be this famous scientist. 
the other. You can get people to the moon, to Mars, to Saturn. Uh, you know, Pluto's not a pl planet anymore, but you can find some other planets, <laughs> right? So, but, so there's a lot of the standard scientific things out there. There's a lot of the engineering things out there, you know? My son wants to be a he wants to have a company that designs race cars, you know, and he's loved race cars from an early age. And, and so there's there's all those standard things. But I want you to know today there's actually a lot of really super cool uh, in in the sciences, in in technology, in engineering, in math. And 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 we and a lot of people add a now uh, arts for steam because it really is kind of the same creative thought process. Um and so you you have a lot of really neat jobs. Like one of my clients, uh, she she uh, designed uh, fabrics for Nike, and I was like, "What a cool job! Like, sign me up for that. I'd love to take six months and intern there. Like, what goes into the textiles and making them everything that they need to make?" And I'm like. Kind of laughed, right? Like, hey, <laughs> uh, but you got things like disaster management, you know, how do we deal with the hurricanes? What's the science that goes into the hurricanes? I mean, can you, if you've never taken atmospheric transport classes, let me just tell you, they're a bear. Now I took, now we're moving in. Oh, oh, I really didn't think y'all were going to see how <laughs> I'm still unpacking. I thought I shifted the screen enough, but oh, well, you've already seen it. Um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, I, I've taken most of my physics and math books filled out the whole thing. And as a background, it was really quite, it was really quite imposing. I mean, it was very, very like, uh, oh yeah, I'm smart. But that really wasn't, that wasn't the, that, you know, most of my classes that I teach aren't about being smart. They aren't about science and they aren't about tech. They're about, they're about self-leadership and they're about finance. So I don't want you to see atmospheric transport and, you know, nuke this and, 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 and all those different books. So I took them all down uh, or rather I have not unpacked them and put them here um, like I did in my previous office. Uh, be, but, but it's a bear. Atmospheric transport is a bear, but, but somebody has to do that stuff. And some people are naturally gifted. And if you've got an area in your life that you're naturally gifted at, I want to encourage you today. Don't, don't just give up on it because other people tell you, you can't do it. You know, uh, and, and, and I don't, I'm not going to knock anybody here. I believe that most parents are trying to do the best job they can, but my heart has broke so much since I moved to Louisiana and, um, you know, people, people say the, the craziest things you've got a straight A student. They're like, you need to drop out of school and go to job course so I can get you out of my house. Like, like this child has a straight A's. She understands math. She thinks in matrices, like, and you're going to have her drop out as a junior and go to job core. Like, ah, so, so I want to tell you today, don't let anybody else make your life decisions for you. Okay. You, you have an opportunity with a career in STEM to do some amazing things. And, and that plus the super cool jobs and the money, that's really one of the, one of the, the, the biggest things that I want to leave you with today. You have opportunities in STEM to make history. You know, like that job that my boss didn't want to do because he was chasing tail. I ended up writing reports for the president. I got to do all of these super cool things that you've seen on TV, but I can't talk about. All right. So, so you have opportunities to do something that nobody else gets the opportunities to do when you have careers in STEM. Okay. Okay. So that, so, 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 the, so I, I wanted to lay that foundation uh, and next week, when we talk about win the game, we're not going to come from that from a STEM perspective. Win the game is really going to be more broad based and apply to anybody who feels like they are in a situation where the industry culture or your culture kind of collide or clash and you're not really part of the majority group. OK, uh, so so I want to encourage you in, along those lines. The next thing I want to talk about today I want to talk about some challenges that come from being a minority in STEM. Now, this first one that I'm going to talk about isn't necessarily about being a minority. I actually said that wrong, okay, because I'm going to talk about being a minority next. <laughs> um, this one was the challenge of being poor. This was my challenge. My primary challenge other than race was being poor. And so the reason I want to highlight that is because I think a lot of times people associate poor habits with minority habits. In fact, I was talking with a coworker a couple months ago when I was still at work, right? Uh, when I was still active duty um, or when I was still I'm not on terminal leave. Uh, I was I was talking with a coworker about 
racism and some of the issues that we have in schools. And we had what I thought was an amazing hour long conversation. Like I felt like she was really understanding where I was coming from and that I was changing hearts and minds and that she was going to have an appreciation. And right at the end, she says, well, you know, my son goes to a black school and, you know, if they would just you know, pick up the trash. There's trash everywhere in that school. And, you know, if they would just have a little bit more pride in their environment, then, then, then maybe they would do better, but they just don't care about their environment. And I looked at her and I could tell I had a whole nother hour of going off on her and it wasn't going to do any good. So I grabbed my stuff and I walked away. Right. But what she was doing was she was equating poor problems to 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 black problems okay and we have to be really careful uh not to equate poor problems with black problems and that's why i brought this out specifically we're talking about my challenges not every person of color is poor although for me Although for me, I didn't grow up with a lot. I thought I grew up with a lot because my mom was awesome and worked hard, right? And she did what she could. And uh, I didn't actually know until um, junior year. And I'll, I'll share that story some other time with you. Um, but, but the thing is, there are very significant challenges to being poor. And while one is not cause the other, very often when I work with poor children, I am working with children of color. Okay. And so, so that's why I want to talk with that a little bit. Okay. So, so when you don't have a lot of money, you may not realize that there are things that other students do to get ahead. There are things that other professionals do to get ahead. And because you don't have money or your parents didn't have money, you may not know about those opportunities or you may not have been introduced to those opportunities. So, for example, when I took my SATs and my ACT, uh, I didn't know that people pay for their kids to have ACT prep or SAT prep. I didn't know such a thing existed. In fact, I didn't know any of that existed the first time I took the GRE when I went to grad school the first time. And then when I tr went to um, apply for my PhD, then I discovered there's all this world of preparatory materials out there. And I was like, wow, how did I not know this? And all the people around me were like, what do you mean? Didn't you do that to get into college? No, I just went in and took a test. <laughs> my scores were still higher than yours. <laughs> but there are a lot of, when, when we're poor, we may not realize that there are a lot of resources out there to help us succeed. And I encourage you to go look at your library for things like G, GRE prep or SAT prep or anything like that. There are so many community resources. Now, of course, this comment is mostly directed towards students and not as much career professionals, but there are also a lot of opportunities in our community to network and grow ourselves uh, that we may not have considered. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit later when I get into the game, the win the game. Okay. But challenge of being poor, that was a really tough thing for me. Okay. Um, so <laughs> there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, opportunities out there and there are people there are people out there who love to pull others up who are working hard. They don't love to pull others up who are acting entitled or superior. Okay. Uh, so, and, 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 and so that, in, <laughs> that in addition to race was a big struggle for me. And so, and the reason I say it, and the reason I keep emphasizing that is because most of the really brilliant technical scientists that I have, that I have come in, come in contact to with in the air force, you are so much like I was 10 years ago. And I just want to say, please get this, <laughs> get this now. So you don't make all the mistakes I made. You still have time before you put on your next rank to actually do great things by learning how to not act like a physicist. <laughs> okay. And so if you have the challenge of being poor. Like for me, you know, one of those challenges was, um, not having money for college. Like I remember when my mom sat me down and said, well, if you want to go to college, you're going to have to get a scholarship because we don't have any money to send you. And I don't know that, I don't know that my parents had ever thought about college before, you know, it was just like life was happening and they were trying to keep everything together. And then, oh, all of a sudden this one's a junior. And she's actually got great grades. So she might want to go to college and we don't have nothing to do for that. Now I'll tell you what my mom did for me though. I'll be forever grateful. What she did is she made me fill out the application to the Air Force Academy. And somebody said I dated myself with the Kmart, uh, the Kmart comment. Well, I'm going to date myself with this comment. 
Uh, I took that Air Force Academy application. I crumpled it up and I threw it in the trash because I went to ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade, four different schools. And I had no desire in being in the military. Okay. And my mom picked up that thing. She said, um, I told you to fill this out. She smoothed it out on the table and she said, you're going to fill that out and turn it in. And I ended up getting a full ride scholarship to the Air Force Academy. So that was a blessing. All right. Another problem, another challenge with being poor is sometimes we feel like we don't have enough money for the proper equipment. And I was one of those rare people. I was one of those rare people in grad school. They have the little computer lab with all the old computers and everybody else is at home with their big Macs and everything. Right. Um, but I didn't have money to get a good computer. I barely had enough money to pay my bills. I told y'all how broke I was, right? I couldn't even afford the Kmart credit card. <laughs> I couldn't even qualify for the Kmart credit card. And so um, there's ways to be creative. Like the first time I bought my TI-85 big fat calculator, I actually sold, an, uh, I had a teacher that helped us sell enough money to buy it. And then I left it in the bathroom and someone stole it between classes. And so he, he let me sell more candy to buy another one because otherwise I wasn't going to be able to do it. And here I am an AP calculus and then needing to, needing to buy something that everybody else's parents just handed them like candy. All right. And so I want to encourage you to look for available resources and not let it stop you. See, we got to stop letting things stop us just because we don't think it's possible. Or we got to stop listening to people in our lives who are going to tell us it's not possible. It wasn't possible for them because their mind couldn't comprehend it. But you have the ability to shape your life and you have the ability to do whatever it is you feel called to do. OK, so the next challenge we're going to talk about um, it, that that I had I had faced in my career, we're going to talk about the challenge of being minority. Now, I'm going to talk about the challenge of being a minority and then I'm going to break out the specific flavor. So we're going to talk about the challenge of being a minority and then I'm going to talk about female and then I'm going to talk about being black. All right. But uh, right now we're going to just talk about the challenge of being a uh, minority. OK, so whatever, whatever minority you are. And there's so many new flavors of minority now that they didn't have then. And we think, again, this is one of those commentaries on society. We, we call ourselves so tolerant when we're actually, in my opinion, increasingly less tolerant than we used to be. We just have all these new categories to put people in, but, but that doesn't mean we're any more tolerant. All right. And so one of the biggest challenges about being minority, whatever minority you are, is the stereotyping being you're already perceived as being lesser. And so you have to work harder to prove your worth. Now, for anybody who is a person of color or anybody who is a woman in a man's world, you already knew that I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But I hope I'm telling somebody who doesn't realize all that, that that is a very real thing, even in 2020. Another thing that people who are minorities, whatever flavor of minority it might be, that have to deal with is what's called bicultural stress. This is trying to be true to yourself while taking on the culture of your organization. Okay. So in order to succeed in an organization, you have to really kind of put on the culture of your organization. And a lot of people can put that culture on and then they go home and they just take it off, right? They just cast it aside and they be themselves at home. But for people who find themselves as a minority, gender, race, age, fill in the blank. Uh, when, when you have a huge gap, it's, it's like a heavy weight. It's not just a light jacket. It's a heavy weight. And so there's this bicultural stress of trying to be true to yourself while also taking on the culture of the organization so you can succeed. And remember what I said in the beginning, a lot of times people will hear something like this and say, well, if that's a problem, just go find you another job. I mean, come on, why would you even stay? I wouldn't stay there. You know, you know, like I love, we had this forum. We had this forum and 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 we were and, and people of color were talking about how their kids get treated in school. And some of the other people were like, well, I would just pull my kid out of that school. And I just sat there like, I, I have so much I want to say because you can't just pull your kid out of the school when it's every single school in this region. You know, and uh, and I'm not going to go off on this too much today, but since we're on the topic, you know, there are some places in the military base where the military still runs that school on base because of the racial dynamic in the local community. 
So don't tell me these aren't still issues today. All right. <laughs> all right. I'll move on. I'll move on. Okay. Another issue that we have, depending on, you know, and, and, and really this is, this is any of the new boxes that have been created to put people in, right? You still find the same problem. Tokenism, the perceived lack of value because you're the token, even if you're not, you know, when I was at the Air Force Academy, um, again, not blaming everything on race. I am acknowledging up front that I'm, I'm, I was loud mouthed, opinionated and weird. I did not fit in with the culture. I did not fit in with my peers. And I had, I, my thinking doesn't align with regular thinking. And so in some areas, that's great because I could do all these amazing things over here. But when it came to personal interaction, whoo, no, I stunk. Okay. And, um, I'm only okay now because uh, I'm because I work at it, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not even amazing. Now my son, now he's amazing. He's like a natural. He's naturally gifted with people, right? Um, but 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 it it broke my heart. You know, not even not even the guy telling me I couldn't declare physics because I was black. That that didn't that didn't break my heart. What broke my heart was finding out after a year and a half or so that my classmates thought I was only at the Air Force Academy as a token and that I didn't deserve to be there like they did. And I was like, now, wait a second. I got a presidential nomination. Wait a second. I grew up, I went to four different schools. You know, I grew up mostly overseas. I had these four different, um, from ninth grade to 12th grade, four different schools. I was, I was, you know, vice president of key club. I was on German American soccer. I had all this leadership experience. I had higher SAT scores than most of the people in that room. And yet all they saw of me, oh, I done lost all my Facebook views. <laughs> oh, for those of you who are watching this after the fact, we're doing this live. And, and, and as soon as I started talking about this, all those views just dropped sharply. That's okay though, because this needs to be, this needs to be said. All right. They all sat in this room and started talking to me about, you know, you don't deserve to be here and this and that and that. And I was like, wait a second. How, what did you score on the SAT? Oh, 1145. I'll, Prof that well, I scored I scored a 1200. Now look, this was this was 25 to 30 years ago, right? This was a little bit the scoring was a little bit different back then. But my scores were higher than most of the people in that room. But yet to them, all I was was a token. I was just there to check a box. And I checked a couple different boxes because I was both a woman and I was a minority. And that, as far as anybody was concerned in that room, that was the only reason I was at the Air Force Academy. It had nothing to do with my straight A's at AP's classes. It had nothing to do with my leadership. It had nothing to do with my advanced uh, speaking in German. It had nothing to do with anything else other than the fact that I was a black woman. And, and for many people and minorities, that's the problem that you have as well. Okay. Now, I, I will. I will talk a little bit more about the antidotes to this. Okay. And so, you know, we want to, we want to find the right networks and mentors and advocates. Okay. But I want to encourage you today, whatever, whatever your challenge is that you're facing, I want to encourage you to stay positive. Okay. You don't want to become bitter about your struggles. I mean, I'm a little bit more expressive now because in two weeks I'm off of active duty. And so in about two weeks, you're going to see me be even more expressive <laughs> and tell even more stories. Right. Uh, but, but the reality is those things shaped me and made me who I am. And if it wasn't for those challenges and those things that people said or did, I might not actually be where I am today. So while it's not right and I don't agree with it, I'm not going to sit here and wallow in self-pity. Instead, I'm going to look at the life that I want to have. I'm going to chart a path to it and I'm going to roll on. All right. And so should you. All right. Next challenge that we want to talk about today. I want to talk about the challenge of being female in a technical world. Okay. And I already kind of, I already kind of made some comments related to this. So I, I won't spend as much time as I normally would on this topic, but I think it's important to realize that today we still have significant challenges for women in STEM. One of the biggest challenges that I've personally seen is that you're just not encouraged and you're often teased. So you could have the same ideas as a man, but the man's ideas are going to be praised while yours will 
will be teased. And there are so many times where I had more elegant solutions to problems than my coworkers or back when I was in school than my, than my um, fellow classmates. But yet, instead of celebrating the fact that I found a unique way to do something because my brain thought differently than theirs did, instead of celebrating that, instead it was teasing or jealousy, okay? Another very real problem that women have in the technical world is that bias. You know, there's a still a strong bias against women. There was a recent study where applications for a lab manager position were sent to hundreds of science professors at six leading research institutions, and half of the applications were labeled John and the other half were labeled Jennifer. Every application y'all was identical except for the name each professor was asked to rate the application and suggest a starting salary the result i'll bet you already know what i'm gonna say don't you the applications containing the name jennifer were rated as less competent and less likely to be recommended for hire than applications containing the name john Jennifer's average starting salary was $26,500 compared to $30,200 for John. The bias against Jennifer was prevalent, get this, in both male and female science professors of all ages. This isn't just a guy's problem. This isn't just a white people's problem. This is an everybody problem. We all have to work together to solve this problem. But before everybody works together to solve your problem, you got to work to solve your problem. Okay. I'm just letting you know some of these things that are problems that you may never have uh, known about. Okay. Now there's another problem that you'll find with women and that is the generational bias. Now this is different from generational bias that I talked about earlier, where I talked about generational discrimination in that, oh, you're too mature to do something. You're too old. You're going to retire sooner. You're going to be sick all the time. You know, or you want to take all your vacation time. Yeah. I want to take all my vacation time. I've worked all my life for it. I, I, I want to take it. <laughs> um, or, or on the other end of the spectrum, you're too young. You can't possibly know anything. And that's not true either. I mean, you know, I, I get it, but it's not true either. This, what this generational bias is what I'm talking about is one where a lot of the generation of women like me had, a, had a, our, our parents had a bias against women who thought or behaved like us. So I heard a lot growing up, get your nose out of those books. No man wants a woman who reads. And I, and I was surprised to discover that most of my female coworkers, not that I've had that many, but most of the ones that I have had, we all had the same experience. We all had the same mother and we all had the same experience of feeling the same things and feeling like we don't fit in to a man's world where women were supposed to be pretty and accessories rather than actually do something with their lives. Okay. Another another challenge of being female is going to be childcare and motherhood. And I'm going to tell you, it can absolutely be done, but I personally feel that it can be done, but at a cost. Okay. So um, uh, astrophysicist and MacArthur Genius Grant Award winner Sarah Sega of MIT, Sager of MIT says she's going to use her award to her $625,000 award to pay for childcare to help her concentrate on her work. Now, I remember being stationed in the D.C. area and paying $2,600 a month for child care because that was the only place I could get my son into uh, when he was when he was uh, when Cubby was born because there was such a long waiting list everywhere else. You say, well, what were other people who didn't have money doing? Well, they were giving their children to unlicensed, undocumented workers. And I wasn't going to do that considering all the things that my oldest had experienced. So, you know, high earning men, they don't have those kinds of constraints. They don't win a huge $625,000 prize and say, you know what, I'm going to put this in savings because I'm going to need this to find somebody to watch my kid. You know, uh, women find that they need a wife at home. 
And I don't mean like a physical romantic wife, but they end up hiring a lot of successful women end up hiring somebody to be their house manager, to be their maid, to be their, to be their maid, to be their nanny and all those things that the woman traditionally does in a household. Now households are changing, but you know, um, one of the things that I saw in my professions is that men and women who stayed late were perceived differently. The man was perceived as being dedicated to his job. The woman was perceived as not being able to hack it, you know? So those are different challenges, okay? All right. I want to thank those of you who are holding, hanging in there with me. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the challenge of being black. And I already told you my story about blacks can't do physics, about not being invited to the study groups, um, you know, them not realizing I'm the new chair of this or that muckety muck technical committee, right? Um I don't want you to say, oh, that was 20 years ago. That's not really applicable anymore. Race struggles still exist, especially for black and brown scientists. Not all minorities now are negatively viewed. And so since the time that I developed this talk, I have actually talked to some folks who do feel that being Asian in the in the technical world, especially for women, has been uh, that they that they have experienced the same levels of discrimination that I have. But I've been told by several other people, um, hey, you know what? When I walk in the room, everybody automatically thinks I'm smart because I'm Asian and I'm, I have no idea what's going on, but I'm going to ride that out. And you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't hate, you know, you got an advantage, use it to your, to your, you know, you use it. But, um, I, I'm going to tell you, there are very real perception issues with, with, the way the technical world perceives minorities. In fact, um, one of our local um, doctors posted on her Facebook page this article about how uh, somebody got upset that the the numbers regarding the lack of people of color in a particular flavor of science. And, and, and I thought to myself, well, well, why would you be upset that somebody's highlighting that like it's true? Like, why are we going to be upset about the truth? You know, be upset about fake news. Don't be upset about the truth. <laughs> that said, though, I'm going to tell you, being a minority can also be a blessing because when you walk in the room, you stand out and you have an opportunity to make an impression. Both at the Air Force Academy and when I went to get my master's at the Air Force Institute of Technology, uh, I found that I was often the only person who looked like me in the room. Now, I know we have a very large um, uh, be a Black Engineer of the Year Award and Black Engineers um, Society, I think they're called. Uh, I, we have a very, very large contingent, but in physics, we didn't. And, and in my lab, there was nobody that looked like me. In fact, <laughs> I remember one time I was sitting there, I was sitting there in my lab in my graduate school, and um, I, I'm sitting in the lab, and I poked my head out when I heard somebody walking past, like, there's no blacks in this department. And I'm like, hey, I'm black. And they were all like, you're black? We thought you were from India. <laughs> you know, because I straightened my hair out. <laughs> look, look, no comments on my hair. I've been natural for over 15 years, y'all. I went natural before it was even cool. So I don't want no comments on my hair. But yeah, they thought I was from India. <laughs> and so they went and took my pictures, right? I'm telling you, the, the marketing photos I took at the Air Force Academy and also at the Air Force Institute of Technology, they were in use. They were in use for years until the Air Force retired those uniforms, okay? So, so even if you feel like the deck is stacked against you, and it may well be, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to give up, tuck your tail between your legs and settle for like a minimum wage servile job. OK, you were meant for more. You were meant for more. If you're watching this and you've been watching this, you were meant for more. OK, because if you weren't, you would have dropped off long ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to show you I'm going to show you how to get more. Now, again. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of my win the game system. Tonight's class was really about establishing the foundation of the kinds of things that I struggled with in my career. Not only will this let you know if I'm somebody that really that would really resonate with you as far as being a mentor or an advocate for you, but it also lays the foundation of where my philosophy came from. OK, and so I'm going to give you a quick overview of the win the game system. And then next week, we're actually going to cover it in more detail with a class called win the game. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm so creative, aren't I? Win the game. G-A-M-E. It's time. It's time you won the game. 
And like every, every other speaker out there, you know, game is an acronym. It stands for goals, advocate, mentor, and excellence. Now, truth in advertising, I think we should start with the foundation of excellence, okay? We would then establish our goals, we seek mentoring, and we develop a relationship with an advocate. That's the order I actually like it in, but EGMA does not sound as cool as game. And when the EGMA just doesn't have a good ring to it. <laughs> so if you can help me figure that out, I will, I will gladly take your input. But, but just because, just because I want to talk about it first, let's talk about excellence. Okay. So when I taught at Air University, there was an original Tuskegee Airman named Lieutenant Colonel Herb Carter, and he was a regular speaker at the college. And he kind of saw over the times, cause I was, I was hosting him. He kind of saw that I was struggling a little bit and he pulled me outside and he taught me that excellence was the antidote to racism. And, you know, people make their snap judgments and you really can't talk them out of their opinion. Like, right. You can't talk them out of their opinion. You can't meme them enough. You can't yell at them enough. You can't shame them enough to change their mind. I mean, come on, you know, you have to show them that they're wrong. And we see all over social media, it's almost impossible to show people that they're wrong because people don't want to be told that they're wrong. Even when they know they're wrong, they don't want you to acknowledge that they're wrong and they're not going to publicly acknowledge that they're wrong. Okay. So we have to show excellence in order for people to intrinsically see that they are wrong. Okay. And excellence isn't just what we do. It's who we are. OK, so to win the game, we must be excellent. We must not do things in an excellent way. Yes, we do things in an excellent way, but we have to be excellent. We have to walk in the energy of excellence and that energy resonates with their energy and it resonates with the energy of other excellent people and it begins to change people's minds. And I built my career upon excellence and I changed many minds about what black people are capable of. Okay. So who we are is the foundation. And when we walk in excellence, we can achieve anything that we set our minds to, which sets me to, leads me to the next requirement that I want to talk to you about tonight. So to win the game, we must have goals. Okay. We must have goals. What have you set your mind to? What are your goals? I happen to pick three male, I happen to pick three white male dominated career fields. First, I started off in STEM and then I went into finance and now I'm doing finance and public speaking. And for all of them, you know, you got your struggles that you've got, right? But, but how many of us ever stop to think about where we're going? Yeah, you got struggles here and then, but, but, but rather than address all these little fires, let's begin with the end in mind. And don't get me wrong. You got to work hard. Absolutely. Okay. But you need the work hard to be in the right direction. Okay. You know, how many of you watching this today have been working so hard and getting no, who else gets frustrated when this or that person who is way less qualified than you is rocking your boss's world? They're getting all the accolades. They're getting the publications. They're getting the promotions. You know, one of the reasons that people who aren't as good as you are passing you by is because they may just may be more clear about their goals. We may not be truly clear about our goals. I know I wasn't. I was doing everything for everyone and I wasn't even on my own priority list. You know how people say they're at the bottom of their priority list? I wasn't even on my own priority list back then. And that has to change for us, okay? So I really want to encourage you to think about where do you want to be? I mean, have you ever really thought about it? And I don't, I don't mean wished about it. I don't mean hoped about it, but I mean, seriously sat down and thought about what it is you want to do and who it is you want to be. And I mean, visualize your goals that you can tell me how the suit you're wearing feels against your skin, that you can tell me what kind of furniture is in your condo as you open up the front door. And what it, what it looks like when you, when, and feels like, and smells like when you go out to the deck and you watch the sunset over the lake, 
What does the perfume of your spouse or your significant other smell like? How does the sun warm your face when you're on that Caribbean cruise? How does it feel to have a long line of people waiting for your autograph? I mean, when we set our goals, I want to encourage you to really dream about it. Really get down to the nitty gritty and write out what you want. Many of us have never taken the time to write out what we want. We don't even know how to, how to, how to quantify that. We don't even know how to imagine it. It's almost too much for us, you know? And, and we did this all the time as a child. We imagined all these things. My son constantly imagined, oh, I'm, 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 I'm fighting with this sword one minute and he's a pirate the next minute. And then he's Mario the next minute. And I roll with him, right? Cause I want to encourage that imagination. But you know, um, we did this as a child, but somewhere along the road to adulthood, we stopped dreaming. And if we actually do succeed, a lot of times we don't trust ourselves that it's really because of anything we did. We think it was a fluke. We think if anybody really gets to know us, they'll find out we're a fraud. We go around saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, anytime we win so other people won't feel bad about themselves for our success. What do you want? What do you really really, really want. Take the time to find out what you want. Now, next week, we are going to work through this principle with a Purpose Vision Goals workshop. It, it is admittedly going to be a shortened version of my half-day Purpose Vision Goals Workshop, but you're still going to get a lot out of it. So if you join me, you'll really hone in on your purpose, your vision, and your goals in a way that many of you have never seen before. It is so powerful. All right, real quickly, I'm going to cover the last two and they go quicker. Okay. The next one I'm going to cover is mentor. A mentor is someone who's done for you what, what you, they've done what you want to do and they show you how in order to shorten your learning curve. There's a difference between mentoring, training, coaching, counseling. So let me just spend a few seconds on that, okay? Training is teaching somebody how to do something. So this is, this webinar today is training. I'm showing you how to win and I'm showing you, I'm not giving you all the details, of course, but I'm showing you the steps that you need. This is a training, okay? Coaching is a way of bringing awareness up to someone's uh, a, a, conscious mind. Okay. And so a coach is going to ask questions to help you uncover what's in you and to help you uncover and explore the things that, that have been holding you back and the blind spots. Counseling is something that is very, very essential, especially when we've been, when we've been bound by trauma. Okay. So, you know, a coach shouldn't try to counsel. A, a coach should know when to refer somebody to a counselor. Okay. And coaching and training isn't the same thing. If you come into my office and I'm telling you, do this, do this, do this, do this, do that. I might be training you. I might be mentoring you, but I'm not coaching you. OK, and so a lot of coaches, you know, coaches in, coaching is largely unregulated. So there's a lot of coaching out there, coaches out there who um, are really just kind of trying to tell people how to live their lives. All right. So mentoring, mentoring is is where you're you, you could be showing someone what to do. You could be telling someone what to do. When I go to my mentors with a problem, I'm asking them their best practices for solving it. What they're doing is they're shortening my learning curve, okay? And so you need all of these from time to time, okay? Uh, training shows you how to be competent. Coaching helps you get past limiting self-beliefs and blind spots. And counseling helps you overcome significant trauma. But mentoring is different. Mentoring is a shortcut to learning things that otherwise would be learned by trial and error. Now look, some lessons can only be learned by yourself, right? When I'm a part of John Maxwell mentoring, and when I ask Paul Martinelli how to structure a contract, I'm happy I paid my annual fee for him to tell me how to structure it without a whole lot of trial and error. Now, you don't always have to pay for mentoring. In fact, I was able to get solid mentoring in the Air Force without paying for it. Uh, but in the business world or in a world where the deck is stacked against you, I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to pay for quality mentoring. Because some relationships don't begin until the mentor sees that you're serious. Okay. All right. So um, let me see. What else do I want to say on mentoring? Oh, yeah. 
we need to say this. Make sure your mentor has actually done what you want to do. Most haven't. Oh, they'll pontificate and they have a lot of theories. They read a lot of books. They might even have some really nice slides and a great mentoring program. And you can go to their website and you can sign up for their monthly program. But if they haven't had the struggles that you've had, or if they haven't actually walked the road or achieved the level of success, then you want to be careful what advice you take. Okay. So now, so that doesn't mean you're only going to take advice or find mentors that look like you or have had the same struggles. Okay. And so with that qualifier, let's talk about how to find a good mentor. I guess, I guess the interesting thing is some of my worst bosses have actually been good mentors and some of my best bosses have been the worst mentors. I mean, especially the ones that didn't understand the struggles of being a minority because they didn't see any issue with my color or my background. You know, uh, they didn't fully understand that their peers did. You know, so I would always recommend starting off with your supervisor, uh, but, but, but be in mind that you're going to want to have more mentors than just that. But I do recommend starting with your supervisor, whether or not you like them, okay? Whether or not you think they're a good boss, uh, you're not necessarily scheduling a mentoring session with them to gain pearls of wisdom, but you're getting seen and you're trying to build some semblance of a respectful relationship or at least learn who they are and what makes them tick, okay? Now, if you're in the military watching today, uh, I highly encourage you to sign up for mentoring sessions with as many different senior leaders or leaders who are senior to you, not necessarily all the four stars, right? But I would encourage you to sign up for mentoring sessions with as many different uh, leaders as you can. Uh, I've learned so much from various professionals because I took the time to request a mentoring session. Now, when you see somebody in your career field that's doing something extraordinary, try to find a way to talk to them, whether it's a formal appointment on their calendar or asking them to lunch or even volunteering where they volunteer. You want to get on board with their agenda before you ask them to get on board with your agenda. So that's why it's kind of important if you want to build a mentoring relationship to, to kind of get to know who they are and what their agenda is. And then you can help get on board with their agenda and build the relationship that helps them get on board with your agenda. You know, one time I, I approached a scientist who was a, a sitting squadron commander and I was like, how did you get this job? And he was like, you know what? I've done a good job. I built a lot of networks and I was in the right place at the right at the right time. They fired somebody else and they need and my friend needed somebody he knew would do the job and he knew that I would get the job done. And I tell you what, I ran into that same gentleman years later. He was retired, now a civilian working in the federal system. And I was the chief of protocol for a four star command. So it was really neat for me to be able to come back and say thank you so much for that one little mentoring session way back when. <laughs> he also told me in that mentoring session, I needed to stop pursuing an ops research degree because it made it look like I couldn't hack the physics and the science and the math. I was like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't say that out loud because he was a lieutenant colonel and I was a captain at that time. <laughs> um, so so um, you want to go and find people that, that are doing something that you want to do and, and see if you can get on their calendar or go to their lunch or volunteer at their, uh, what's important to them and, and see if you can build a relationship. You never know where it will take you. And one thing that I have found, and I do as well, is that, you know, an hour of my day to mentor somebody and for the people that poured into my life, an hour out of their day to mentor me, it's something that most people who've accomplished a lot love to do. Okay. All right. The final thing I want to tell you about mentoring is that uh, don't feel like you got to have a mentor that looks like you. I heard this advice all the time and I thought it was funny because for most of my career, I never saw anybody who looked like me. <laughs> if I waited around for a mentor who looked like me, I wouldn't have none. Wouldn't have none. I'd have none. I don't know. Anyway, it wasn't until right before I got ready to retire that I actually reached out to Air Force Personnel Center. And I was like, hey, somebody told me I was the first the first person of color to be a physicist. Is that true? And they're like, no, uh, so and so and so and so they're they're Hispanic. They're Hispanic p physicists who are ahead of you. And one of the guys I went to college with and um, he actually he actually is uh, ahead of me in um, in the Air Force. He's, he's done a great job. I'm really proud of him. Uh, and, um, but I was the first African-American and I was like, man, all this time, I didn't know that. That would explain why I didn't see anybody who looked like me. Well, I was just trying to do my job. You know, I wasn't trying to be the first this or first that I was just trying to do my job y'all. Okay. So it was only when I got on a Magicom staff, did I actually see commanders and senior leaders who look like me. And for those of you who aren't military, Magicom is like one of our big, 
uh, groupings of people. So for this particular grouping of people was like 31,000 people. Okay. And so only when I got at that staff level, you know, did I see commanders and senior leaders who even had any color like me. Most of the people I worked with, they weren't female and they weren't any kind of minority. All right. And so you want to reach out to everyone and you want to see with whom you'll stick, right? Like you don't know, you don't really know. You can't judge. Okay. Okay. As a holiness preacher, you might be surprised to learn that two people I learned a lot from about how to execute my career. One was a Muslim man and another one was a lesbian woman. Okay. And she was, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her because she was matched to me as part of a formal mentoring program that I signed up for. And she was junior to me in civilian grade, but she was the only one in the group that had the skill set that I sought out of all the pool of mentors. And it was basically, I knew I needed to learn how to build relationships with people. And she asked if I would be comfortable, given my religious, uh, my religious background and the fact that I was technically, even though I was military and she was civilian, I was technically senior to her. And I agreed because I, I'm here to get better, right? And if you've got the skill set I need, I really don't care about all the externals, right? And she helped me immensely. But I was really, really surprised that she didn't think that I was going to want to learn from her because of her lifestyle. And I'm like, I, your lifestyle doesn't dictate whether you got the skill set I need. You know, again, we call ourselves being so tolerant. I'm not going to go on a rant. I'm not going to go on a rant. We call ourselves being so tolerant, but our society really isn't any more tolerant than it used to be. We just have more boxes to put people in. And we still want you to stay in your box and the boxes can't mix. Right. Okay. So, uh, and I know a lot of, I know a lot of people don't, don't share my belief um, in the Christian world. And I think it's kind of a shame. Uh, I think we're, we're really too quick to dismiss people just because they're different from us. You know, I, I shouldn't have to say that on a talk about how I was told blacks can't do physics, but we all as humans, we're searching for acceptance and belonging. And many of us were brought up in cultures of intense shame. And so the only way to a lot of people really appease that shame is by finding ways that, that they're better than others so they don't have to feel so small, right? I mean, we all know people who watch these shows of, you know, The Biggest Loser or Jerry Springer. Well, I don't know who's out now, Dr. Phil. They don't watch the shows so they can actually learn anything from the shows or about the struggles of the people, but they watch the shows so they don't have to feel so bad about themselves, right? Like that's who you're dealing with. Okay. And so, so, so I'm, 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 you know, you know, that's not me. Those, of you know, me, you know, that's not me. And, and if you, and it's probably not you, if you're a scientist, because actually you're probably the other way. Like you're so egotistic, you know, if you were doing this, this, this thing, you know, your head would be like that. That's, that's how my head was. <laughs> and so seriously, one of my chapters is if you think like a physicist, your subordinates probably hate you. <laughs> Okay. So, so this may not apply to the scientists in the bunch, but, um, I just want to encourage you don't dismiss people. Yes. People have flaws and yes, people have different ways they live. And, and, you know, if I only hung around people who thought like I did, I'd be eating in a party of one every single night. Okay. And I'm not here to judge anyone. And I'm going to encourage you to set judgment aside when it comes to finding a mentor, especially if you've re been on the receiving end of a lot of discrimination, or if you've been traumatized, I encourage you to get, get the help that you need to process those things so that you can reach out for the mentoring you need to succeed. Okay. I'm not here. I may be a holiness preacher, but I'm not here to judge people. That's between them and God. The Bible says you got to work out your own soul salvation. That's what it says. All right. So if you ask me now, 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 now you come to my church and you ask me what I think about what you're doing and how you can grow closer to God or grow more spiritual and power. Right. Oh, I'll tell you all day long. Okay. Uh, but that's why people know, don't ask me a question. You don't want the answer to, because I will tell you what I think. All right. But that has nothing to do with learning your job and has nothing to do with building the networks that you need to succeed. Okay. And so those of you of biblical faith, I encourage you to look up Daniel and to look up Naaman and look up Jesus. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Somebody's like, I did not sign up for this. I came to a talk about uh, blacks can do physics. Okay. So last step, the last key to help you win the game. We're going to wrap up here in about two or three minutes. Uh, the last key, the last key to help you win the game is advocate. And this is a key piece that many corporations and especially the military will require that a lot of us don't know about because it's not written down anywhere. Okay. 
So a mentor can short, shorten your learning curve, but the advocate is somebody who opens up doors for you. And the advocate is somebody who, um, oops, let me switch that. The advocate is somebody, uh, let me, let me start that over here. Okay. Uh, the advocate. All right. Okay. So when the mentor shortens your learning curve, the advocate is someone who opens up the doors and they bring you along. OK, they, they, they meet you, they, I mean, they introduce you to the people you need to be introduced to. They 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 put you in the positions, they drop your name, they make the phone call like who, you know, one of my one of my uh, former one of my mentors was telling me one time, who, who do you know that can make the phone call you need to make sure you get this contract? And I thought. Well, I don't know if I know anybody like that. And they're like, well, you need to learn how to build the network to have the person that can make the phone call to get the contract. Okay. And so those people are your advocates. Okay. You know, uh, you might think, well, why would anybody, why would anybody who's of that high of a stature that could say the word and get me the contract or say the word and get me the job or say the word and connect me with somebody who could open up doors for me? Like, why would they even care? And I'm telling you right now, you know, when, when you, when you come in contact with greatness and they want to pour into you, you find a way to let them pour into you. But the thing is, is so many of us, never even come in contact with great people like that because we don't believe that we have anything to offer them and we don't believe that they would take any interest in us. This all goes back to the self-image. Okay. So if you haven't already signed up for my self-image class and any of this resonates with you, I encourage you to do it. We just kicked off. You haven't missed much yet. All right. You've only missed the introductory and that one's free on my page. So you can get caught up real quick. Okay. But a lot of times we don't even go after this. Because one, we don't know we need it, but two, we're, we don't feel like we can build those kinds of relationships. But as we mature, one of the greatest things a successful person can do is to pour into the life of someone else. It's almost a way of leaving your legacy. And so I encourage you, search as you're going through your career, search for an advocate or two or three or four. I, mean, I had one, uh, one coworker, he had an advocate that he built a relationship with for a long time. And then right about the time it was time to go up for full bird colonel, that, that general retired. And my, my coworker reached out to him and the general was like, dude, I'm retired. I can't help you anymore. You need to find somebody else. <laughs> And it was just like that. I was like, yeah, I'm retired. Like, <laughs> bye, you know? Okay. So, so, so I want to encourage you to build those networks as you go through your career. All right. Right now, 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 while you do see advocacy happen through paid mentorship, kind of private access kind of programs. Okay. And then I do that, you know, I do that for people who speak at my conferences, you know, most advocates actually do this because there's something about you that resonates with them. You remind them of themselves or their kids, or their own hopes and dreams, okay? So as you pursue your dreams, and as you build your network, be on the lookout for an advocate. All right, I think that's enough for one night. I hope you really enjoyed this today. I'm super excited about this. Uh, thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to... Um, tell my story and, um, you know, the, the, you just kind of talk about this whole technical realm, uh, next week's workshop. Again, we're going to do that purpose, vision goals, and we're going to dig more into excellence. I'm also going to offer you next week an opportunity to dig much deeper into this content to really grow yourself into the kind of technical leader that succeeds no matter what obstacles stand in your path. It's going to be great, and I hope you join me. I'm JJ Conway. Thank you so much for watching. Y'all take care and be blessed.